Okay, thank you everyone for joining our panel on the issue of deterrence, arguably one of the uh, <coughs> bread and butter tasks of NATO. I'm going to heed the advice that was given earlier and try to s stop being polite and perhaps be a bit more pessimistic. And I mean that in the best possible way, in the nicest possible way. But we just cannot close our eyes to the fact that um, the unity that we need to project deterrence is perhaps lacking at this point. And I'm curious to hear um, the panel's view on this, and I'm very curious to hear the audience's view uh, to what extent that holds true. Uh, before we start, um, I wanted to ask the audience a question that perhaps can help um, guide a little bit or gauge where we stand today. And I want to, so I want to ask you all to load up your um, apps, if you could. And there will be um, a multiple choice question posed in that. And in the meantime, I'm going to introduce uh, our panel today. <coughs> we have from Lithuania the, de the defense minister, Raimundas. Karoblis, welcome, thank you. We have a general, retired General Knut Bartels from Denmark, a former chairman of the NATO military committee. We have uh, Commander Helena Linda Yes, the first uh, female commanding officer of the German Navy. And we have Noam Persky of Palantir International. So the question you see here, is perhaps one that I found myself um, struggling with preparing for this panel, because you can, pose, you, can add, you can make the case, if we don't have international unity, transatlantic unity, this could be a very short panel, meaning there is no deterrence at all. But of course, um, last I checked, NATO still exists, and with a little bit of luck, President Trump will affirm Article 5 today, and uh, we'll all go home happy, perhaps. So um, please take uh, 15 seconds, I was told it would take uh, to, uh, to vote. And then I'm curious to see what the result is. Ah, OK. <laughs> so we can't be doing everything wrong, it seems like. Yes, still in the lead, 64% say yes, 35.8% say no. Interesting. So we don't have to be perhaps that pessimistic after all. I would like to get to our panel now and ask uh, each for about two to three minutes opening statements, starting with you, Mr. Minister. Well, thank you very much. And indeed, it's uh, very uh, important. I'm glad to, to, to participate in this event and this distinguished panel. Yes, indeed, we need to be optimistic, but on the other hand, to do our, our homeworks, which taking into account the present situation, where we are. So the, from uh, 2014, where it was the turning point for the, uh, the uh, world probably order, in particular Europe, with, with uh, Russia's aggression in Ukraine, Crimea annexation and aggression in the, in the uh, east uh, you know, of, 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 of Ukraine, we saw very clearly that Russia does not respect an international order, international agreements, and the values like sovereignty, independence, territorial integrity, and others. So, want with that or not, we have uh, conventional threats, new conventional threat, which is, which is, which is Russia. And uh, really, Lithuania is one of the countries of NATO which is uh, really most vulnerable from NATO alliance, from this aspect, from the conventional threat, as well as, of course, we face permanent attacks of, uh, from, from a hybrid side. And uh, a lot uh, was, was done during, from 2014. So the EFP presence, and, and probably it's one of the most efficient mechanisms so far which, which, which we have. And probably it's the, the stance, political stance of NATO, as well as the mechanisms which, which we have. These are the major factors why Russia could be deterred today. I'm speaking about today. We, we have the day of the summit, but really we need to do, to do much more. 
We expect that this summit, we will, uh, leaders will adopt uh, the readiness initiative, which will be really important, 30-30-30-30. But uh, on the other hand, the readiness of Russia is, is, is as quick. So we very much expect that it's, it's really just the beginning, very good start. We will need to, to follow on. Secondly, so the continuation of the adaptation of, of NATO structures to the conventional threats again, which uh, efficiently started in Wales then in, 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 in Warsaw. And uh, of course, uh, other issues uh, should be, would be the taskings, taskings for the uh, follow-on forces, we really, the enforcement, uh, really, really it's, it's, it's major subject and also uh, enablers like air defense, maritime aspects and others. And another, quicker decisions to military, to, to, to the secure, and we very much expect that this uh, continuation will, will follow and we will have the real deterrence and, and it will be sufficient to tackle this uh, conventional uh, threats. And, and this is the task for, for, for NATO, in my view, for the, for, for the future. Of course, we should not forget also the South, which, which also uh, really the, the situation and NATO has to play here. We should not forget also, also hybrid. All countries, we are facing uh, interference from Russian side. So cyber, fake news, but also interference in, 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 in poli political aspects. And here, really, we need to, to bring more and more attention to that, to cooperate closely, to have uh, joint instruments. We have already some with the significant space for the improvement. But also, in addition to that, in particular, attacking hybrids, we need to work with the society. Mm -hmm. Resilience in society is, is, is really one of the uh, major tasks uh, could be, I know that it's not uh, very convenient sometimes for politicians to say to the society that picture is not the rose as they want, but uh, we had that in Lithuania, in the Baltics. And uh, to be serious of the defense, uh, uh, as the defense alliance, we also need to work here. Mm -hmm. And with, with, with going further, we, we very much expect that uh, this deterrence measures, which is the, the best deterrence measure is the preparation for, the, for defense, uh, will work. And we will have uh, so the sufficient measure to tackle Russia's aggression, but not only, not only for today, but also for the longer period. Okay, thank you uh, for a view if you will, from the, the flashpoint of the terms. Thank you very much. Mr. Bartels, please. Thank you. Uh, I would like to share with you what I call the three plus three of uh, deterrence of today in uh, 2018. The first three are one, political will or capitals. Are they willing to fight for the values they stand for or which they proclaim they stand for? Two, the forces which are available and which, by the way, belong to our nations. Let's not forget that we should not talk about NATO forces. We should talk about the forces of the nations and the nations put at the disposal of my third dimension, the NATO command structure. The NATO command structure is a tool which makes it possible to use the forces of the nations in upholding our political will. This is what I call the first three dimensions. They include the, the nuclear one, which of course is always unpleasant, but we need to be able to think the unthinkable, unpleasant as it might be, because we will always be confronted by the unexpected. This brings me to my other threes, or my other set of three, of which the first one is the eastern direction, where we are facing Russia, unstable, but to a large extent, predictable. Then we are facing the second strategic direction, which is south, southeast, which in the Middle East and North Africa, I think we can safely say is both unstable and unpredictable. And then my third direction, which is north, northwest, the Atlantic, the high north, which for the time being is stable and predictable as long as it lasts, depending on how we see the development in the high north. Those are the three plus three of deterrence to be looked at by Moscow, by Beijing, or whichever capital doesn't like us for a number of reasons. This is brought together by a tool which is called training and exercises. Those, the training, making sure we are ready to what we are going to face, even though we might not know it, 
train for the unexpected, train for full spectrum operations, and on top of that, exercising, which is a political signal of our coherence and our ability to work together and thereby to deter a potential opponent. Those two dimensions are absolutely essential in bringing together our political will, our forces, our NATO command structure in three different strategic directions which where, we, where we might have to fight simultaneously a different opponent. It all comes down to what this summit is exactly about, political will. The circle has been closed. Thank you very much. Thank you for pointing out that there are several dimensions to deterrence. It's not just um, putting forces in strategic locations, but there, there are different ideas to what makes effective deterrence. Commander, please. Yes, thank you very much for having me here. It's a great honor um, <coughs> that I'm allowed to represent the tactical level as well a bit. <laughs> Um, when I joined the German Navy in 2001, which was, by the way, uh, the year where the German armed forces were open for women in all areas, um, the general perception was that uh, we were surrounded by friends and partners and everything was actually very good, so everything was downsized. And um, now everything is going back to uh, collective and homeland defense. And um, so the nations really need to, to do a lot to get back to where they were uh, 25 or 30 years ago. Um, from my experience as a commanding officer of a mine hunter in the German Navy, I can say, um, especially looking at defense and exercising, as the general just, uh, just mentioned, and there's a lot being done. I've been deployed for half a year with my, with my ship and my crew to standing NATO mine countermeasures group one. So there is a lot being done, so I can really understand why people still believe that NATO, the poll we had in the beginning, um, is definitely able to, to deter Russia. Um, and of course, a lot more is, uh, needs to be done and we need to work on interoperability and um, continue doing, uh, working in all those fields. Um, but on the other hand, I think that we're not as bad as we always uh, say we are. Um, looking at uh, the point of uh, deterrence, uh, I asked myself the question whether there is an end state to deterrence and I think you cannot define an end state to deterrence. Um, as the, the stakeholders in a, in a scenario or in, in the world develop, um, deterrence also needs to develop and we need to maybe think about new ideas or new ways of deterrence. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation and thank you for alluding to that you bring a tactical view to this uh, conversation. <laughs> <laughs> no one, please. So, uh, it's a little strange as a technology guy to be up here amongst policymakers and, and tactical commanders. Um, but I think at Palantir, we have this weird perspective where our technology is deployed in support of most member states of NATO uh, and way beyond. But not only on the civilian side, uh, not only on the military side, but on the civilian side as well, in the, in the broader security apparatus. And so it provides a pretty interesting perspective. Um, and I, I've kind of picked out a couple of, of points on deterrence from what we kind of see happening across the world. Um, they're written down in my extended brain since I'm a technical guy, uh, so apologize for that. But uh, you know, I think we all hold that deterrence comes from our collective preparedness to respond. Um, I think what we're finding when we, we look across things is that that collective preparedness is really based around compatibility and the ability of, of rifles to use each other's uh, bullets is pretty given. Um, but our ability of our intelligence operations to use each other's data is not. And I think that's really something that everybody's rudely awakening to now. Now, I, we're making progress, again, in, in training and exercises. Trojan Spear this year, the, the special operations exercise held across Europe, was really the first proper example of being able to operate on uh, a unified data platform and being able to operate on insights and respond quickly regardless of nationality. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's really important to build on as we go forward. You know, I think the, the other piece here is that the idea of preparedness really needs to move beyond the conventional response. 
the minister was alluding to this, that the hybrid or disruptive warfare is something that we're seeing as, as a matter of fact, kind of ongoing position. And, and to the question that was posed, do I think NATO is, is an effective deterrent against conventional war? I would probably also say yes. Is it an effective deterrent against hybrid warfare? I would venture to say no. The repercussions are not there, and it's very, very, very difficult uh, to identify attackers and to, and to properly respond. So deterrence actually becomes uh, an even bigger deal in, in the world where disruption and hybrid warfare is, is the norm. And I think here uh, we end up in a, in a very interesting place where the conception of understanding the human terrain becomes really, really important. You know, conventional military terms, <coughs> understanding where your enemy is is incredibly important. Uh, but in a disruptive hybrid world, understanding where your enemy is is much, much, much more difficult. And it also crosses between the civilian and the military space in a way uh, that's quite novel. And that really puts a lot of our traditional structures uh, at play, you know, where militaries can't surveil their own populace, their own citizenry. Uh, how do you understand where to look? How do you understand how to map the human terrain? How do you work between civilian agencies that have counterterror missions and counterintelligence missions and the military space? Do we have the legislative uh, room to do this? And do we have the technical platforms and technical prowess to do this? Because we've developed military technologies and civilian technologies in silos. Um, and so now we don't only need to interoperate between countries during our exercises, but our agencies within our countries need to interoperate. And that's a, that's a very, very, very difficult dimension that we see kind of across the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for we'll get back to the issue of technical compatibility. I want to stay a little bit on the issue of uh, intangible uh, compatibility, namely because we have this rift between Washington and much of Europe. And I want to ask you, Mr. Karoblis, coming from a country where um, you, you, you need NATO to be there, and seeing here um, President Trump's comments beforehand, sowing this disunity. How does that make you feel? Well, indeed, NATO is, is the, has the existential meaning for, for Lithuania, for the security. It's really an existential aspect, and we need NATO. But also, we need the, the, the leadership of, of the United States. And, and uh, I agree with colleagues that really we need the political leadership, political will, and, and also, of course, we need the unity, which is the key. And the real deterrence could work only if we are united, and if the Kremlin has no doubts that the, in case of the uh, aggression, uh, the Article 5 will work from the day f f first day, and it will be the, the adequate response. Uh, speaking about the United States, well, uh, we will always rem remember the role of the United St States in, in, in our independence, starting from non-recognition, then 2014, when with uh, reinforcement of air police mission, then the company uh, level assurance initiative, and then even now. So really, we have, uh, this year we had the largest scale exercises in Lithuania and the Baltics. So um, by the scale led by, by, by Americans, so we have the presence. We have excellent cooperation in, in, in different formats with different forces. Well, you mentioned soft exercises. It's, it's, it's really one of the most important issues. So really, we, we communicate each, each, each and every day. We have a lot of assurances starting from uh, Secretary Mattis, let's say, messages, which from the very beginning, from January, and then February, and we have now. So the, the, in April, it, it was uh, the summit between three Baltics and, and, and US, three presidents, four presidents, and uh, we have the assurances, we have the declaration about the concrete cooperation in the security matters, and of course, of defense. So really, without, we don't have any doubts, both in NATO and the and, and, and United States, we treat uh, the NATO, United States, and some kind of tensions and, and, and in, in, uh, unpredictabilities as the matter of the family. 
everything is going in the, in the family, but here we really need to find the agreements and to live together, be united for the sake of NATO alliance, which the, where the importance is, is, is increasing, and to work together both in the eastern direction, in southern direction, and uh, in every direction we, we, we need. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You mentioned um, NATO and U.S. leadership as they are one thing, but they could arguably be considered two things. Is one more important to you than the other? So both aspects are really important. So both both uh, bilateral with with United States, but nevertheless the main main frame is is, is NATO, and uh, so both Europe needs and we need need the, the the European Union, and we believe that the United States uh, also need uh, needs need 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 Europe. It's about uh, uh, allies and and about the legitimacy. Of, of, of what 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 we are doing in the world, and uh, also it's it's uh, about working with countries of like-minded uh, countries and and which could 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 have a unified position. So it's definitely we need to safeguard this this multilateral uh, uh, approach uh, which we have. On the other hand, we are speaking not only about the United States, but we, are, we could speak also about the four other formats of the cooperations, like, for example, Joint Expeditionary Force led by the United Kingdom, uh, European Intervention in Initiative of France, but we believe that this, these formats could amend the NATO uh, structures, NATO efforts, but, but not uh, compete. So we very much think that, uh, uh, of course, uh, we don't have any option, not no any plan B, than to have NATO as the uh, defense uh, collective defense alliance in Europe with the leadership of the United States and the adequate contribution from European countries. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Commander, I wanted to get back to you because you, as a tactical member of this panel. We talked in the green room briefly about some of the missions you did out on the Baltic Sea. Tell us about, about that and where sort of what the deterrence in practice looks like. It's a terribly theoretical term, I think, so we're interested to hear. Yes, I think it's, it is terribly theoretic and a lot of people probably can't really imagine like the small things that happen maybe at sea um, that fall into that area of, of uh, deterrence. Um, well, I, in 2014, I was deployed for six months with my, with my ship um, to, as I said, Standing NATO Mine Countermeasures Group 1, and we uh, operated mostly in the Baltic Sea. There were uh, eight ships in total, and um, also in the, in the North Atlantic. So what we, uh, what we experienced uh, was um, when we had exercises, there were also Russian units near near our group, looking at what we were doing. Um, of course, you have that, you've all heard about those encounters at sea and uh, the, the story which was in the news where the, the Russian fighter flew by very, very near to a, to a frigate. Um, in my opinion, well, that, that was all we encountered. So in my opinion, I think you shouldn't dramatize uh, the situation, um, but rather look at it from a, from a perspective that um, allows to, to develop uh, countermeasures against it and stay focused on how to reply and not, not seeing it as a huge problem or not thinking that Russia might attack NATO in the next months. So I, I would say the situation isn't as bad as it always looks like. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, General Bartels, as someone who has worked inside uh, in the depths, the underbelly of NATO, if you will. If you if we look at the bureaucracy of how NATO is set up, is there the potential for the alliance to work with a more comprehensive understanding of what deterrence is? And I'm talking about the mechanics inside, how things are measured, uh, the, the different uh, contributions uh, the nations made. There definitely is, uh, but it brings us back to what is a fundamental dimension, which is the alliance is made up of the 29 allies. And the 29 allies 
discuss and deal what they want to discuss and deal with. It is not something the bureaucracy invents. The bureaucracy, from my experiences, can be quite imaginative, come up with good ideas, give the right advice, but if the capitals, for whatever reasons, good or bad, have a different perspective, it doesn't go anywhere. Also, we have to keep in mind that consensus at 29 can be tricky. Not so much the newer members, rather the old founding members can be tricky, uh, but that's how it is. Uh, so, uh, I think it's important to focus on what the capitals are thinking and what all of you present here, you go back and say to your capitals and to you, whatever, whatever, wherever you're coming from in your capitals and say what needs to be done and how are we going to do it. This would be much more than anything else we're facilitating. And then let me just come with a very short remark because picking up exactly on the commander's perspective, we should be careful not to dramatize. Now, some of us in this room uh, have grown older, maybe not wiser, but at least older. And we remember the 70s with the impact of the Vietnam War on NATO, and the 80s with the peace movement and the double uh, decision due to the stationing of SS-20, Soviet SS-20 missiles, etc., etc. The peace, the huge peace movement demonstrations which were manipulated by the Soviet Union, the left extremist uh, terrorist organizations such as Rote Armee Fraktion, the Red Brigade in Italy, etc., etc. And now we are surprised by what we are seeing, maybe was in a slightly different color. It has never been easy. It is not easy today. And to make everybody comfortable, tomorrow will not be easy either. Mm -hmm. Because that's the reality of keeping together an alliance. Mm -hmm. uh, Norm, you mentioned something about um, hybrid warfare and the potentially a mismatch between what we think might deter a country may in fact not deter them. Uh, so uh, I want to pose the question to you and also the minister. Do we know exactly what deters the Russians? Mm, could you please be more specific? Like, do we know what, what, does NATO know what to do to deter Russia? Well, of I course. Mean, I'm, I'm saying this because, for example, the, uh, there is um, whatever NATO does, uh, Moscow will sell to its populace as um, something that is, was not intended to be. Well, first of all, we need to do everything, of course, uh, to take all the necessary measures for de deterrence and, if necessary, for defense. It's the first aspect. And uh, the, what, what was done in Wales, and in particular in, in Warsaw, it's, it's, we think that it's good uh, beginning and not only. But uh, yes, we need uh, more. We need uh, the full implementation of Warsaw decisions as a reinforcement strategy, and we, we expect uh, to have it enable us and others. And uh, so the, the level of deterrence is, 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 uh, depends uh, on the, of course, on the, on the level of our preparedness and how serious we, we, we are looking for. Is, will it be enough or not? Uh, well, uh, Russia is, is also looking, uh, despite some uh, irrationalism, which is by the breaking the order, so Russia is, is uh, looking also from, uh, partially from the rational point of view. It's looking to the opportunity. If we will not get these opportunities, of course, the deterrence will work. If we will give the opportunities, it will create the doubt for the, let's say, for unity, or we will have something else in the world when uh, the Kremlin regime will try to, 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 let's say, test the unity of NATO. So it will fail. We need to take at least the measures which, 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 which are necessary to do and uh, to continue with, 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 with political will, and, and we will have that. Now, regarding hybrids, yes, it's a very important uh, tool, of course, uh, for, by, by Russia. And uh, I mentioned already the issue of the resilience. In our case, uh, we, I think, in Lithuania, but also in general in Baltics, we succeeded to increase the level of the, level of the resilience of the population. They, they are more critical in terms of fake news and, and, and other aspects. Of course, we need to, to build, and we're building, investing quite a lot of, of cyber. But also the same, uh, it's, it's necessary now for you to do in, 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 in other 
NATO countries, because one of the aims of, of, of propaganda is to affect the societies by the propaganda. Another direction is, of course, Russian own population, and the specificity of Russia is always that, uh, so in case of uh, internal problems, social unrest, etc., so the all rulers of Russia, they were inventing external enemies. That happened also in Ukraine. And also, in the case of such situation, of course, Russia would look to the opportunities. We really need to be very careful to that and, and, and really to do everything to, 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 to avoid uh, so the situation. And lastly, I spoke about the unity once again, uh, but uh, and, and uh, really we could speak a lot. Really, we need uh, to have on all aspects of, of, of NATO. We need on the, also on the political decisions, which, which, which may be not, not very popular. So we need to look for on the objective glance, which is the situation on, in real, for example, on the basis on intelligence, but then uh, not as, 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 as we want. Really, so for example, we must avoid the situation that uh, really somebody saying that and that is impossible because it's impossible politically. We need to look to, to look to look objectively, and also we need to prepare it for for, for quicker solutions and to adequate responses. Mm -hmm. Noam, I want to get back to you on the issue of, as, as as someone who represents a company that crunches numbers works for intelligence agencies, special operations forces. What can you tell us about the NATO? And, and the question may not be as self-evident as it seems. What can you tell us about? Is there a mismatch between what we think we need to deter against and what we are deterring against? And unpack this for me. It's a, it's a hard question. I mean, I think to, to begin with, I think this, this uh, conception of deterrence and then preparedness begins with intelligence. Right? If, you, if you don't understand the threat, how are you going to prepare for it and how are you going to respond to it? Um, and I, I think in the conventional sense, our, our conception is that intelligence is built up over, over a very, very long time by realistically conventional means. Um, and then we have conflicts that, that are low intensity over a long time, hybrid conflicts, conflicts in the Ukraine where we have little green men, uh, where our traditional means of gathering this intelligence and synthesizing it into something useful are really uh, challenged. And uh, our ability to use all the sources available to us, our ability to share that with each other so that data turns into intelligence is actually quite limited. Uh, it's, it's high within each silo, uh, but our ability to share it and kind of create a common sense of what is happening in the Ukraine, for example, uh, and share that, and do that at a time scale uh, that is deterrent, I think is the real challenge. So if given an infinite amount of time, Uh, we, can, we can come up with a good picture of things, but the world moves incredibly quickly. And uh, the minister was alluding to this, there, we, we give opportunities, or there are windows of opportunity, and closing those windows of opportunity by moving from intelligence to operation incredibly quickly, I think is, is the key to properly deterring uh, emergent conflict. And so a lot of this is, what is your technical preparedness to do this? What is your legislative framework for the ability to do this? But really, um, in, in the special operations context, this, is, this has been something that people have been working to for a long time. So can we have zero gap between intelligence and operations? So we prepare our intelligence, we make some decisions, we go into the field, and then our, what we're doing in the field evolves based on new intelligence. And that sounds like very matter of fact, but anybody who's actually been in the military context understands how hard that is to actually do. Because the bulk of this work is being done by producing PowerPoints and showing them to each other, and then reporting back on radios, still. Um, and so, If we want to properly prepare for and deter emergent conflict, we have to demonstrate the ability to respond really, really quickly uh, and action, create intelligence, action it, um, and create a kind of a, a virtuous cycle of understanding the world, acting on it, and then uh, and understanding the new situation. So I think that's, that's my perspective. Okay, thank you. Please. Yep. Uh, I think you are picking up uh, an issue which is extremely important, the intelligence dimension. Maybe the greatest hurdle today when we are talking about intelligence is not so much gathering the information and putting together a coherent picture which can be presented to the decision maker. I think that can be done reasonably fast with modern technology, trained and experienced people, etc., etc. It's of course not something you create from one day to another. 
But the real issue is when you present that to the decision maker, be he military or he or she military, or political, be he or she uh, the polit uh, minister or whatever, then comes a real issue. Does it fit into the preconceived world which the person in charge has of what is going on? Military history, and the same goes for political history, is full of surprises. And generally speaking, the information was available, but it didn't fit the purpose. I will not bore you with an endless list of military examples, but it might be taking place at the very moment. Okay, um, at this point, I would like to open it uh, for questions from the audience, not everything has to be, it can be very straightforward. Yes, please. And, and then you, sir. <coughs> <clears throat> Thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, I represent Ukraine, and my question is uh, to the Minister of, Foreign, uh, of Defense of Lithuania. I'm sorry. Uh, the question is about uh, the not uh, about readiness of NATO, but also about willingness, political willingness of NATO to defend its allies. Also, as we know. Um, this Article 5, if Russia will um, pretend somehow on Lithuania, I'm sorry that I'm talking about this, um, do you think that NATO will use this Article 5 to defend Lithuania? Because as we know, Ukraine also has defense guarantees under the Budapest Memorandum. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the question. Yes, we don't have any doubts that, that uh, Article 5 uh, would work, but uh, it's named to his family. Well, we have the, the guarantees here, but of course, to, with the efficient response, we need, of course, specific measures. Now we have, for example, defense plans, which we did not have b b before, before Ukraine. We have the presence uh, we, of, the, of our allies. And the situation is, is very different from what we have, for example, in 2013, when really we needed to rely only on the national armed forces. But in the case of the conflict, of the imposition of uh, application of Article 5, and arrival of, 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 of reinforcement and support from, from, from allies. First stage already we have. Uh, we had in 2014 and until this, this uh, summer U.S. presence with the comp infantry company level. Now we have division of labor. So with, with the presence of the EFP battle groups in all of the Baltic countries and, and brigade in the United States. In this situation, in the case of aggression, aggression will be not only against, let's say, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, of three countries together, but indeed against, first of all, 23 countries and then NATO. And it significantly changed the picture. And also, once again, political will, which uh, now we, we believe that is present. Already, so the, one of the examples is the sanctions, which applied to Russia because of the annexation of Crimea and aggression in, in, in Donbass. So the political will is, is to continue to of them and from time to time to strengthen them. So political will is, 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 is here, and uh, well, we don't have any doubts that it, 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 it will work, and it is the best measure of the deterrence. Yes, sometimes we have some misunderstandings in the family, but it's the family matters, and we really could not give any opportunities to our adversary that it's really that he uh, could think to, 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 to risk testing the uni unity of NATO and the reliability of NATO. So, yes, we are members of NATO and the guarantees, they, they definitely will work even in the worst possible scenario. Thanks. Thank you for the question. The gentleman there, can we have a microphone here, please? Um, thank you, Stefano Stefanini, Atlantic Council. I was really intrigued by uh, what uh, General Barton said at, at the very end about the mismatch between information and uh, uh, decision making. Obviously, I've, in my diplomatic uh, life, I've run often into the mismatch between diplomatic reporting and uh, political decision making. But I would have thought that at military level, what matters is the information, whether or not uh, that you adapt your decisions to the information, and if 
you make a mistake if the information is not correct, but not disregard an information that you think is correct. Am I wrong? Please. Unfortunately, history is pretty rough on the issue. In 1973, the Israelis had come to the decision that Arabs cannot attack. Unfortunately, the Egyptians crossed the Suez Canal and the Syrians launched a major armored attack against the Golan Heights. But it didn't fit into the picture of the world as seen from Tel Aviv in 1973. And it led to the late mobilization and so on and so forth. All the indicators were available. It didn't fit the purpose. You can take the Tet Offensive during the Vietnam War. The intelligence officers said, it's coming. There is something going on. Steady, we're doing better than ever. It broke the back of the American population's will to fight the war in Vietnam. I will stop here because I can continue. And it will be boring to this. Uh, not for me, of course, but that's something else. Uh, <laughs> and therefore, I think we all need to keep in mind, be it the political decision-making level or the military decision-making level, that are we seeing what we want to see or are we seeing what really is taking place or shaping up? And it's a question which can never be answered fully, and it's a question which needs to be asked every single day. Okay, in the back there, please. Good afternoon. Uh, Alice Pagny at the Johns Hopkins University in Washington, D.C. Only the General uh, Bartels has mentioned the role of nuclear weapons in NATO's um, strategy, and so I would like to address the question to the other speakers. In your view, what's the role of uh, nuclear weapons in NATO's deterrence and defense posture? How has it evolved, and, and how should it evolve? Thank you. Who wants to take that on? Okay. Who? Yes, uh, well, uh, thanks. Uh, of course, I understand that it's a complicated uh, question, and from time to time we have divergent, divergent views also in the, in the NATO how we perform. But starting from them, we need to have in mind that Russia's military doctrine already directly said that uh, sets the possibility to use uh, so nuclear weapons as ordinary measure. So and, and really we, we, we need we, we are faced already with the problem and 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 uh, also on the other hand so the strategic uh, nuclear uh, Russia is using also one of the most significant uh, measures because otherwise so economically in the scale they could not compete with NATO. So in this case we don't have any other option to, but to also to use this this uh, let's say weapon this tool also from the from the from the NATO side. And uh, also it's uh, for, let's say the modernization and that adequate view uh, to, to the strategic nukes from NATO also it's it's its aspect of of of, uh, of uh, deterrence and well with both sides uh, looking uh, in quite similar way of course in that case only in that case being strong also it's possible to have the negotiate and to, to find the solution so in our view so the role of of, of NATO and and its uh, nukes in particular when Russian has uh, does such uh, uh, posture, both strategically and tactically, so really we need to pay more attention. But of course, it's for the biggest power of need, powers of NATO. Please. Thank you. Uh, hello? Yes, uh, Richard Skolos, MP from Latvia. Uh, so I will just follow the invitation to be maybe uh, maybe less politically correct. Uh, so my assumption for the past at least decade, it seems that NATO has become more reactionary to any uh, external threats or impulses. It's, it's that, you know, something happens, only then we start to act and mobilize ourselves and uh, analyze the risks and potentials. So, so far we have identified new hybrid warfare as well incentives that are threatening uh, the NATO uh, the whole structure and uh, because of that we have set up new centers for excellence the one in latvia stratcom the one for cyber security in estonia uh, they're conducting an excellent analysis and research uh, but what what i think as a policy maker um, we lack one thing they're not operational and countries are actually not giving 
concrete guidelines what to do with the information that they are conducting. And, and coming to, to my main point, what I wanted to ask, we, there was also an uh, invitation to have more intelligent sharing uh, among the member states. Should we not actually talk about the strategic forecasting, not reactionary politics uh, among member states, but rather really having a strategic forecasting uh, team that is actually setting different scenarios that we can actually portray different scenarios and how to react in the future, near future, distant future. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. Anyone? You have an well, yes, just uh, one, one point um, from, from my point of view. I think there's a lot of strategic forecasting being done in, in the Na NATO countries. For example, well, for Germany, I know there is uh, planning and, and strategic forecasting, but um, maybe it's also um, that you have the feeling that, that we're being reactive because so much is going on. And of course, you can be planning for a lot of things and, and you will never be uh, prepared for everything, actually. And, uh, and it's a process. So if you plan and, and you do that strategic planning, things happen and you, you have to react to those things. And then that interrupts your, your planning and your going forward and then into that direction. I wanted to ask the uh, industry, you first, on forecasting and... So, I mean, I, I would agree that there's a tremendous amount of forecasting going on and a lot of scenario planning and uh, all of this happening. Um, you know, I think, uh, to your point, uh, you, you see the world you want to see as a policymaker, as a decision maker. And, and um, what we see in different parts of Europe, especially, is this, there's, there's uh, different conceptions of, of how committed one is to seeing the truth in front of you. Uh, and, and this is this is very different. That, that makes like the common conception of of what scenarios we're planning for very very difficult. It's a very different experience to work with with uh, Latvia and Lithuania and the populace there, the decision makers there who are very responsive to the threat, uh, to you know other parts of Europe that have very 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 different concerns and a populace that's very concerned with. Uh, counterterrorism and and other concerns, migrant flows as opposed to to resurgent Russia, um, and so. I, I think we, um, the more data-driven we can be, as you say, these places are generating research and ideas of how the world is, and the harder it is to hide behind the kind of the truth you want to see. Uh, so hopefully that will that will help move us into a place where we're we're seeing the same thing. But I think what was very often missing uh, for the, the decision makers we work with is what is the end state that the political class wants to achieve. What is the relationship you actually want to have with Russia? So I would put the question back. You know, it's not a question of scenario planning. It's like, can we agree what the end state is? And, and that's a very, very difficult proposition. Right? Uh, but without that, it becomes very, very hard to have a kind of a shared conception of, of what it is we're trying to achieve with all of our scenarios. Uh, two quick remarks. Uh, the first one concerning strategic forecasts. Forecast, in my little world, is a dangerous word because it tends to bring you to think only about that. What is required is probably a number of scenarios, the one more unpleasant than the other, which you have to face and then reflect upon what you would do if you were uh, so faced uh, uh, with it. As to uh, intelligence sharing, which has been mentioned, and it's in connotation with uh, strategic forecast, well, capitals, Look at yourself. How much are you ready to share? You can only share what you want to give. <laughs> really possible. Piece. I want to move on. Okay. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Just two aspects. One aspect from a strategic communication, it's a strategic mm. view. And uh, so, first of all, the measures, of course, of Stratcom, uh, in, in our case, it's defensive. But speaking widely about the offensive, it's, it's uh, really about spreading the information about the West, about the Western values, about the possibilities. And, and really, we need, uh, in particular, working with, with, with Russian society and others, really spreading this, this information, as it was done in the Voice of America, Free Radio and other. Really, the channel should be open. So this is strategic view. On tactical level, yes, it depends on each and every country, speaking about military aspects about armed forces. We have the procedures, actually. So in the case of fake news, it's the procedures of identification, prioritization, and then response if necessary, and presenting the, to, to the information. As understand, during, during before the every 
our exercise is the same as in NATO. There is bigger or, or, or smaller scenario regarding uh, tackling fake news and generally straight threat com, and the same which we have also vis-a-vis -vis the biggest exercises, for example, before Zappa 2017, we also had some estimations with mm -hmm. potential use of fake news and, and also other measures uh, from Russia. This, this is, uh, should be evaluated and I evaluated actually in all these situations. Okay, thank you. There was a gentleman back there. Thank you very much. I'm Vladimir Kozin, uh, Red Star Federal Newspaper, the Russian Federation. Concerning uh, nuclear deterrence, once upon a time, uh, the US President Ronald Reagan suggested enthusiastically that the Soviet Union and the United States should transit to defensive deterrence that threatens no one. Nobody has ever uh, devoted a special attention, either in Washington or in Moscow at that time. I think now time has come to come back to this notion because we cannot stop modernization of strategic and tactical nuclear weapons. We cannot stop uh, doctrines. But nevertheless, there is a good chance it will cost us nothing, even a one euro cent, to make a transition towards no first use of nuclear weapons between the USA, Russia, between NATO and Russia. Simply because there is an offensive, unconditional nuclear deterrence in the world. And I don't mean that at this very summit uh, participants could arrive at this agreement. But nevertheless, in the foreseeable future, we have to especially in case that their low-yield nuclear weapons can be used. I would like to remind the esteemed audience that low-yield nuclear weapons is less than five or six kiloton. So thank you. Okay. That was more the comment than the question. Thank you. Um, any other questions now? Yeah. Yes, please. <coughs> Hi, my name is Anders Haugset. I am uh, the president of the Youth Atlant Atlantic Treaty Association in Norway, and I'm also working in a government agency that uses Palantir technology, so thank you for that. I have a question for Mr. Persky. So many of today's challenges and threats are techno technology-based. Could you provide some insight into how technology can provide credible deterrence against some of the modern threats we are facing? Uh, outside of armed forces. I'm thinking about cybersecurity, I'm thinking about uh, hacking, influ influencing, misinformation, et cetera. Thank you. It's a, thanks, it's a broad scope of a question. Uh, I'll do my best in the three minutes we have, or a little bit less than that. Um, so I think, uh, firstly, the, the conception of a national approach to these things is really important, and nobody's really managed to do that well yet, to be honest. Um, some of the nations that are under the most threat have, so the Israelis are pretty decent at it, at actually looking at this from a national perspective. What is our, what is our posture? What is our understanding? Um, and so, and I mean this from a technical perspective. So uh, not just securing one agency or just the electricity grid, but what is our exposure generally to, to technical attack? Um, and, and having technical solutions in place so we can actually make good policy decisions based on this. Right? So uh, the problem today is you can't make a policy decision around what, what do we need, how do we need to structure our, our military or our civil response, our disaster response, because you, as a policymaker, don't even understand what is the threat, what is the combined threat to our world. And so we can use technology to, to do that in the same way that we can use technology to understand readiness. So we have huge issues in Europe around readiness because we can't even, and we can't even answer the question, how ready are we? Uh, how ready are our ships? How ready are, do we have the right people for the ships uh, or for the tanks? And there's, there are good technical solutions to this, and we're making a lot of progress. So we can use technology to kind of better understand our posture, which I think is one. It's more of a, like a question of hygiene first, right? Let's, let's wash our hands before we try all the antibiotics and things. So let's do that. And then um, I think the... the uh, idea here is that human beings are very, very good at understanding uh, threats 
and adapting to the world. Right? That's what we're, we're, we're good at. Machines are terrible at it. They're still abjectly horrible. If you ever talk to Siri, you know she barely <laughs> understands you. Um, so this conception that there's this giant AI threat right now that will overtake us and you know, is it, not quite there. But I think we are at the point where we as people need to be better at leveraging technology to fight these emergent threats. Right? This, is, this is very, very obvious in the hybrid campaigns um, that our institutions are very old and we're, we're very, very good at, at understanding things that take a long time to develop. We're very, very bad at responding quickly. Um, but we can leverage technology to, to have a better understanding of our world and then empower the people, the good, great people that we have to actually do the work of understanding what's happening. That's a kind of a philosophical answer to your question. Um, and happy to catch up with you about that, the, the, the details of this a little later. Thank you. In I wanted to, uh, General Bartels, ask you another question as we wrap, wrap up the session. Um, given the disunity we're seeing in the alliance and the effect it has on, on deterrence, because NATO's enemies presumably do not only feel out the alliance in terms of military weak points, but also weak points in cohesion. Is there, is there and this may be, I'm totally off, maybe off the mark here, is there a way to insulate speaking from a NATO structure, to insulate the deterrence ability from the political turmoils that happen, that keep, that come and go, and leave us with something positive to think yep. about. Here. Personal, <laughs> personally, I think that much too much attention is being paid to tweets by a certain person. I don't even bother to read them. Now, I do not matter, so it doesn't matter whether I read them or not. <laughs> so I perfectly accept that criticism if it is formulated against me. I would say as an old soldier, just carry on with a job. Do it as well as you can. Bring our force together, train them, exercise them. That will be noticed in the capitals which do not like us for one reason or another. And don't waste too much time on the rhetoric which flies around us, thanks among other things, to the modern media world. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take that as a very fitting uh, closing comment. Please uh, give a round of applause to our, to our panelists. Thank you, very, thank you very much for coming. And as a matter of housekeeping, uh, there will be a, a coffee break right now. And after the coffee break, there will be a cyber crisis simulation on the main stage. Uh, we will have uh, a session digital forensics demo in the breakout room one. And for the gentleman back there, a new nuclear age is another session in breakout room two. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.